even though hopefully we can all remain uh, you know, on campus and in labs, but obviously we're located across different states and all over the place. So this is a good opportunity to you know, strengthen all of the links interactions across fleet and also talk to some of our partners and people working in areas that are of interest to, to a lot of us as well. So for this uh, first seminar, uh, for the year, and again, we'll continue these monthly, but the first seminar, uh, we've got Denver Lee, who's at, uh, at the sorry, um, at City University, Hong Kong, uh, and originally attained uh, Bachelor of Engineering from Zhejiang University and Master of Philosophy from Hong Kong Polytechnic and PhD, PhD in the Department of Quantum Matter at Geneva. And so he's yeah, recently started as, as an assistant professor at the Sydney University of Hong Kong and keen to tell us about some of his research going across condensed matter physics and material science. Um, and I'll, yes, hand it over to you, Denver, to yeah, tell us about uh, super. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen first. Um, yeah, we'll try this. Uh, do you see my screen now? Yep. Okay, yep. cool. All right, yeah, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to actually meet the Fleet team. And um, um, thanks uh, to Michael for the uh, kind introduction and also many thanks for, uh, to Jeff and Jason uh, for the organization of this event. Um, so actually, um, I, uh, Jason was asking me about my link to Fleet actually, uh, if I could say, all just uh, started from like uh, almost three years ago when I visit and for the first time and the only time actually, uh, Melbourne, um, I met uh, Michael and who introduced me um, uh, Fleet team. You know, we even actually applied for DECRA together, but um, I was fortunate, unfortunate. That, um, I thought it was a great uh, a program, a project that we wrote, but I, I, uh, it failed. Um, anyways, oh, so I would love to, you know, if the situation allows, um, uh, I would love to visit uh, Australia again and meet uh, people in person. Uh, but um, given the situation now, let me just uh, share with you what I've been doing. Uh, mostly uh, the work at Stanford before I joined City University of Hong Kong uh, in last no November. All right. Um, so, um, I'm going to uh, tell you a little about, um, you know, high temperature superconductivity, particularly uh, the uh, material actually emerged uh, last year. Uh, no, sorry, actually two years ago, um, uh, which is the so-called nickelate superconductor. Um, so uh, nickelate being sort of an an uh, analog to cuprate um, were a uh, material of a tart a target for many, many years. So people were thinking uh, to um, actually discover superconductivity in a nickelate compound. Um, so this was realized uh, by a um, experiment uh, I, I conducted together with Professor Harold Wong at uh, Stanford University. So before um, starting um, my talk today, I would like to place it in a more like a, a broad background um, and go a little uh, broader to talk about the materials platform, which is a transition metal oxides. And uh, as we all know that as a candidate, um, together with the many other materials that people actually think uh, uh, to replace silicon, right? Um, because of various issues and limits uh, currently the silicon technology has. Right. Uh, so in, in particular, uh, the material that I'm, I, I'm, uh, I've been always interested in is a so-called transition metal oxides and oxide heterostructures. Um, so um, the, uh, let's say the interest around these materials actually go uh, uh, from, uh, let me see if I can see my mouse somewhere. Um, um, that's weird. I don't see my mouse. Sorry. Okay, um, so the interest actually spans from uh, all the way from fundamental side, let's say uh, that you can realize low dimensional quantum phases states in these materials or heterostructures all the way to the application side, let's say uh, you can have, you know, multi-functional uh, device or you can even 
uh, fabricate like a uh, uh, catalysis uh, for photoelectrochemistry, right? Um, so why it's interesting, particularly for physicists of these um, family of uh, materials is that, is that actually these transition metal oxide normally have, um, you know, strongly correlated D orbitals and um, uh, they're strongly confined, highly directional in space, uh, which um, has uh, everything to do with the properties or uh, functionalities that people are interested in actually in these days. Um, particularly if you want to describe the system well, or let's say you make prediction. Sorry, Jason? It's been done, Feng. You're, you're still stuck on that first screen. Already? From our end. I see. Okay, this one? Yeah, your opening screen is what you're stuck on. We haven't moved past see. the opening screen. All right. That's weird. It Let me stop before. sharing and um, re-share re re again. Okay. Do you see second? Uh, not yet. It says it started really? screen sharing, but... Nothing's right. coming up again. That's weird. So much for testing beforehand. Yeah. Let me see if I try again. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Yeah. Uh, yep. Now we're good. Now Maybe good. That, yeah. Um, try the next screen and the next one. Just go flick through. Couple yet? Okay, you seem to be working now. Okay, cool. The weird thing is, I still don't see my cursor. <laughs> That's weird. Anyways, um, so right, uh, so we need to um, add electronic interactions in in order to let's say fully capture the uh, features or uh, of the system, like uh, 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 that we know all, all know, like a cooling repulsions or. Uh, exchange interactions like or like a poly a bank like a poly ex exclusion principle right okay um so as a very good example of the transition metal oxides that uh, uh, many of you probably know uh, is the perovskite oxide so all these oxide kind of share a similar structure which is the perovskite structure and due to the multiple choices that you can have on the a side and b side as well as the, the interplay of these um, uh, uh, lattice structure and uh, uh, orbital and spin degrees of freedom, you can have all sorts of the functionalities or if you want the properties. So all the way from ferroic properties that I guess, which is part of the uh, fleet activity, uh, all the way to, for example, superconducting uh, properties because uh, many of the um, known superconductors actually are perovskite oxides. And a more exotic uh, uh, things like uh, different or, uh, ordering phenomenon can also happen in these uh, systems. Okay, so that kind of um, uh, uh, bring me to the uh, introduction to my uh, talk today. Uh, so before really talking about nuclear superconductivity, I would like to give a brief uh, uh, introduction on high temperature superconductivity and also why we're interested in nickelates for those, those of you who are not uh, very familiar with the field. Okay, so actually the high temperature superconductors, um, um, let's say stems back to uh, these uh, very uh, seminal uh, discovery uh, by uh, these two famous scientists at the time at IBM Zurich Research Center when and where they uh, fabricated the first uh, um, copper oxide, which uh, ex, uh, displays a uh, very uh, high transition temperature of superconductivity, right? And after many years of study, uh, this um, field has evolved into a very uh, uh, a big and lively field, uh, which is still re remains at the, one of the, let's say, hot topics or one of the challenges nowadays in kind of matter research. Um, uh, especially marked by a very complex phase diagram with intertwined phases and bridge physics. I'm probably a little like uh, contaminated by the, uh, the phrases that use uh, at Stanford, uh, which they, they would like to call it intertwined phases, right? You see from this uh, right part of the slides that uh, you do have uh, uh, different phases, you know, uh, uh, happening 
uh, a near uh, superconductors or within their superconductivity phase. Okay. Um, and uh, almost immediately, or even at around the same time, um, uh, uh, when cuprate superconductivity was found, uh, people uh, have been thinking actually uh, whether we can find other uh, superconductor poten potentially high temperature superconductors in other transition metal oxides. Uh, of course, if you look at the uh, periodic table nowadays, you find uh, uh, indeed a few of them uh, containing transition metals. Um, however, one of the, let's say the most uh, straightforward one would be, uh, uh, for example, nickel, right? Uh, because of nickel just sits next to copper. So whether we can have a superconductivity in nickel uh, oxide or nickelate uh, is a, a big question. And also a, a big interest for, for, for uh, people who are working in, in this uh, area, right? So immediately after the uh, first cuprate superconductor was discovered, which is the lanthanum copper oxide uh, family, um, people uh, uh, were wondering whether, you know, similar uh, crystal, crystal structure uh, can actually, uh, of nickelate can host a superconductivity. So um, um, people uh, fabricated or synthesis the uh, lanthanum nickelate, uh, which has the uh, similar, similar structure and try to dope the system uh, as it was done uh, similar in a similar manner to cuprate. However, uh, these compounds largely displayed insulating behavior. Um, you know, until you, you put a really um, a high level of doping, um, uh, uh, where uh, it starts to show some metallic behavior, otherwise it's insulating, okay? And, and then a further study actually revealed that uh, um, not only that you, you need to have a uh, similar crystal structure, perhaps you need a little more flavor of it, uh, which is the electronic structure. Um, so if you look at the cuprate uh, in a D, uh, 3D orbitals, you have uh, nine electrons occupying like, um, let's say, uh, uh, five uh, orbitals. However, in this uh, particular family of nickelates, you have eight uh, number of electrons because the nickel is just a uh, one a column left uh, to copper. So probably that was the key, uh, uh, which uh, for which you don't really find superconductivity in the, in this uh, particular nickelate compound. All right. Um, so uh, over the years, um, people actually have summarized um, um, by studying uh, carefully cuprate uh, family, uh, some key ingredients were, uh, uh, for which you need to have uh, in order to host superconductivity or high temperature superconductivity, okay? Including, for example, a quasi a 2D layered crystal structure, uh, a D9 configuration, um, like antiferromagnetic correlations, uh, with the spin one half low spin state and um, uh, strong hybridization probably with the ligand, um, et cetera. All right, so following this uh, direction, um, people have been rethinking about nickelates. Um, I would say one of the um, uh, most representative uh, thinking along this line is a so-called nickelate heterostructure. So starting from 2008, if you look at the first reference here, um, so there are a group of uh, theorists who proposed that by constructing a perovskite nickelate based uh, heterostructure as a super lattice, actually you can uh, at least mimic or have uh, some of the uh, factors that I just listed, right? You can have probably large orbital polarizations uh, with the low spin configuration. However, um, uh, experimentally, no superconductivity was found in these uh, uh, nickelate super lattice. Nevertheless, this was uh, kind of a um, um, uh, big motivation uh, for nickelate research in, the, let's say, the last decade. And if you search um, actually more carefully in the, um, um, let's say, material database, you find that there exists uh, one family of a nucleic compound uh, which has layer structure and uh, also uh, uh, possesses, uh, let's say, the uh, similar electronic counts in the d orbital, which is, I call it like a reduced 
Rodson Popper compounds. For the Rodson Popper compound, probably most of you are familiar with. Um, uh, so this uh, a reduced version of it as actually uh, by introducing some kind of a, a chemical reduction, you can take out oxygen from the compound and you have a chemical formula of A N plus one, B N and O two N plus two. Okay. Um, so in this, if, if you look at the uh, formal valence of a nickel, it's actually close to uh, nickel one plus, which is a, a very unconventional uh, valence for nickel. However, uh, if you look at the uh, number of uh, electrons in the d orbital, is actually close to uh, nine uh, electrons. Okay. And uh, particularly, um, uh, so for one of the uh, one member of the uh, this family, uh, which is the n equals three uh, compound, uh, actually. Uh, uh, caught um, much of tension uh, in recent years. Um, it was all, uh, studied in the ceramic bulk form um, uh, like uh, many years ago. And recently a group of uh, people at Argonne uh, National Lab in the US, they uh, successfully synthesized a single crystal form of this compound in the study. Uh, they have been performing a uh, um, very nice study on these uh, single crystals. And they could find all sorts of uh, like a, a ordering phenomena, like uh, or a chart ordering, spin uh, ordering, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Okay. So what I'm going to uh, focus today is actually also one uh, family, a, a member of this family, by taking n to infinity. Uh, so if you take n into infinity, you see that the uh, formula uh, reduces to this uh, one one two formula. Uh, in which a nickel uh, has uh, formerly a one plus uh, valence. So uh, this, called, this is called infilayer uh, phase, which is uh, very uh, the same to the infilayer, fa uh, infilayer phase of a uh, uh, cuprate, uh, which is a, a high temperature superconductor. Again, if you look at the electronic structure, at least the starting electronic structure, electron count are, are the same to the inflator cuprate. Okay, so this is the starting uh, uh, point of my materials. So, uh, um, so without telling you more uh, details about these materials, let me just throw out like two slides about the key points why we're interested in these nickelites. Um, so, DFT-based calculations, for example, LDA, LDA plus U calculations already predict or tell you that these inflator nickelate are indeed have uh, quite a different band structure as compared to uh, cuprates, marked by the presen presence of a small electron pockets, both at the zone center and the zone corner, right? As if you compare with a, a left uh, figure, uh, uh, which is the typical band structure of a cuprate compound. So this system is a kind of a multi-band system if you want, wish, okay? Um, and second is that uh, as we uh, nowadays heard a lot about cuprate is that actually um, uh, because the, let's say the energy levels configurations, you have a uh, actually smaller energy splitting between uh, oxygen 2p orbitals and your upper hopper band, uh, which originates from 3d orbital, right? These energy scale is even smaller than the on site, uh, let's say the Hubbard U, uh, then uh, you have a uh, so-called charge transfer scenario because the, let's the most relevant low energy physics you're looking at is probably Delta rather than U, right? And also because of this, there's many consequences of this. For example, the uh, hybridization between uh, the D orbitals and the 2P orbitals also uh, uh, is related to this. However, because nickel is just one, like a column left, Right for the same electron counts, let's say uh, you have a rather uh, different uh, configuration, namely that the in this uh, particular case delta is probably uh, much larger than the delta in a cuprate, uh, and then the system goes back to a, a more typical uh, mod uh, Hubbard picture. Right, so this is the second point why uh, uh, nickelates are interesting or different from cuprates. Another thing um, related to the pairing mechanism. So we know that in cuprates, although there are some debates, but uh, um, 
there, uh, there seems to be a very strong evidence that the uh, magnetic ordering of the uh, ground state of the pairing compound actually uh, plays an important role in mediating the, the, uh, the pairing, superconducting pairing, right? And uh, people develop this uh, uh, different models. Uh, for example, this is a very famous John Rice singlet uh, where, you know, uh, when you hold dope the cuprate compound, actually those holes go to, uh, 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 let's say oxygen. Uh, and because of these, uh, of these uh, uh, John Rice singlet state actually, you can effectively uh, let's interact with the uh, background copper, uh, let's say copper oxide uh, plane. Okay. Um, uh, in the nickelates, um, the, the the picture is uh, rather un, unclear, I would say, because uh, so for a very limited uh, number of studies, the parent compound of these inferior nickelates uh, did not show. Uh, strong evidence pointing to antiferromagnetic uh, 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 long range order, right? And also because of the participation of these rare earth uh, uh, orbitals in the, in the Fermi surface, uh, we can certainly have a contribution from these. So people have been discussing and proposing different scenarios. And also uh, uh, when you think about crystal field splitting as well as uh, interaction energies, you may certainly end up with a different, you know, pairing picture, like uh, whether it's a spin singlet or a spin more exotic, like spin triplet uh, pairing, etc. Okay. All right. Um, so without further ado, let me, uh, you know, talk about how we uh, make the materials. Uh, so we start from perovskite phase. Uh, so people uh, were uh, uh, very intrigued by the perovskite phase, mostly because, uh, except for lanthanum, all these rare earth uh, perovskite nickelates show uh, a sharp met met metal incinerator transitions with the metal incinerator transition temperature tunable as you change the rare earth site uh, cations. Okay, and then you uh, you can have this uh, very famous phase diagram uh, where not only you have uh, let's say the meta insular transition, you, you can also have magnetic transition as well as a structural transitions. Okay, so what we do uh, uh, to synthesize these um, inflator phase is following this uh, so-called topotactic transitions, which were firstly uh, uh, adopted by chemists uh, in order to examine the, the, the uh, let's say crystal structure transitions uh, under the same topology of the material. So take lanthanum and nickelate as an example. You start from the left part perovskite phase, and then by using the topotactic reduction, you can, uh, 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 let's say, transform the material uh, to all the way to inflator phase by uh, systematically re removing oxygen, especially the apical oxygen. Okay. Uh, so this is a kind of like uh, playing uh, 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 the kid game, like a Jenga tower game, uh, where uh, you, uh, let's say, intentionally take out uh, auction blo uh, blocks without, you know, uh, 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 losing the topology, or if you want, without breaking the tower uh, in your uh, Jenga game. So it's like, we call it like a Jenga chemistry. So what we did actually is a, uh, 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 one step further, not only we did uh, these uh, topotactic transition um, or if you wish oxygen deintercalation, right? By taking the, uh, the apical oxygen, a layer of oxygens, layers of oxygens. We also try to uh, play the same trick um, similar to many other uh, correlated oxide system by introducing uh, different uh, cations to, uh, to chemically dope the system, right? Particularly in our case, we took neodymium uh, nickelate 113 and then we replaced neodymium with a strontium in order to uh, introduce a whole, a whole charges into the system. And these uh, materials are grown uh, epitaxially on STO substrate and then we uh, utilize these uh, chemical reactions to take out the oxygen in order to form the inflator phase, okay? Uh, more pr practically, uh, we uh, grow our films by pulse laser deposition. And uh, um, uh, we have to use a large uh, fluence 
in order to fully ablate out the nickel species in the target. Uh, otherwise, we'll, as you will see, that we'll be facing some like uh, material segregations, um, the secondary phases forming, which, which was quite a challenge to us. And after the, the growth, uh, we just uh, placed the sample and sealed together with uh, uh, a reducing reagent. Uh, in this case, we use a calcium hydride uh, together in vacuum in, uh, uh, in the uh, glass tube. So no matter how many, uh, uh, what, what I tell you, right? Uh, it, in the end uh, comes to a very simple device like uh, uh, showing in this picture, right? We just uh, uh, wrap up the sample with the aluminum foil and placed together with this reducing agent and sealed in the glass tube. And by, by uh, heating up to a relatively a low temperature, typically about two, 260 ish temp, uh, degrees uh, for a couple of hours, so we can uh, reach achieve this inflator phase. So, okay, this is the first sample which shows signature of a superconductivity. So, this was like uh, back in 2018. Uh, so only after almost a year, the paper got published. And um, it was at 2 a.m. in the morning. So which uh, sort of gave me a lesson that all good things happen in the, in the early morning. Um, so where I measured uh, like one sample in PPMS system, and suddenly I found after the system has cooled down below a 10K, I started to see a dramatic uh, resistant drop, right? Of course, it looks a very dramatic uh, in this plot, but if you actually plot um, uh, the range uh, from zero, it's only a very small dip. So certainly the material is far uh, from being, um, let's say perfect or optimized. But surprisingly, it only took us like uh, two weeks in order to reach a full zero resistance, right? So we were very happy and the paper was written Right, uh, and we were very excited to submit the paper. And then we took a picture, uh, a TM picture of the, of the film. And this picture actually caused us uh, another like eight months before actually submitting the paper. Um, so you see a zoo of different phases, right? If you look at the cross-sectional image. So what's encouraging to us was that uh, for the very thin areas close to the substrate, we do have the infinite phase. However, if you look the uh, the the, um, the floors up, uh, uh, you can find all kinds of different phases and segregations. And then we 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 sort of convinced ourselves that this is, must be a a extreme uh, extremely difficult growth uh, uh, condition uh, to achieve in order to uh, have a, a nickel three point two plus state. If you count the valence in the perovskite phase as you dope strontium into the system, right? Um, so the system doesn't really want to form this high valence and nickel. And then uh, by doing reduction, you, you're uh, bringing down this uh, nickel valence to another unconventional state. So it must be a material challenge uh, to, to, uh, to us. So after a couple of months and uh, burning like a two uh, excimer laser, in our lab. Um, so we figured out by uh, growing the film thin and by uh, placing a cap layer on top in order to facilitate the transition, uh, top of tactic transition, we can actually achieve a single uh, crystalline uniform inflator phase. And if you blow, blow up uh, the uh, cr cross sectional TM image, you see that indeed it would have a single crystal films uh, sandwiched between. Uh, both the STO capping layer and STO substrate. So it's, yeah, um, it's a pity that I don't have a cursor, my cursor here. Anyways, if you look at the right part of the uh, uh, TM image, uh, bright field image, you see that before a reduction, which is the, the top panel, you, you can see these uh, apical auctions pretty well. And after reduction, which is the bottom one, you see that uh, 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 a large amount of these uh, epical auctions were removed, right? And if you um, uh, measure the, the uh, lattice constant of the uh, reduced material, 
you do see that it corresponds very well to the uh, infinite phase marked by a shrinked uh, C axis constant. Okay. Now we have the samples and then we, we went on to measure, uh, uh, perform a, a great deal of the transport measurement in order to, at the time, establish the uh, foundations uh, um, or proof that, uh, uh, that we have a superconductor, new superconductor. Um, so first, let me take one step back. Um, so we measured uh, uh, the uh, resistivity curve of the perovskite phase. We saw that for the undoped uh, compound, which is the red curve, we can see a, a canonical metainsulator transition. Right? And after doping, we see that the, uh, the insulator phase is suppressed and then we have a metallic uh, uh, ground state. However, if you measure the uh, inflator phase, interestingly, uh, before doping, you can still have a metallicity down to a certain temperature before the resistivity shoots up, right? So uh, people have been uh, thinking why uh, we have these uh, like uh, interesting behavior. Uh, uh, there are different scenarios proposed like uh, uh, a more straightforward, like a, a localization of physics uh, all the way to a condo uh, scenario. And nevertheless, if you dope the system, you see that uh, the metallicity get enhanced uh, these, uh, in the doped compound. And after uh, roughly 15 Kelvin, uh, below roughly 15 Kelvin, the system uh, shows a superconducting transition. And we also, of course, did a, a bunch of uh, experiments in order to demonstrate the property of the superconductors, including uh, the uh, standard current density electric field measurements, if you want, uh, like IV measurement. Also, the magnetic uh, like response in magnetic field, um, uh, not only in the DC field, but also in AC field, right? Because our system is in a, uh, in a very thin film, uh, uh, geometry and uh, sitting on a, a bulk STO substrate. Um, so they, if you directly measure the magnetization in squid, uh, uh, all the signals are kind of blocked by the, uh, by the contaminants and also the impurities in the strontium titanate substrate. So in order to, to sort of test or show the diamagnetic screening effect, we perform these mutual inductance measurement where we, we indeed saw a, a, a strong signature of a superconductivity. So from, I'll come back to this point, but from these measurements, you already can extract some uh, very uh, meaningful physical numbers, like uh, 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 particularly for the magnetic field perpendicular uh, to the sample plane, you can have in-plane uh, coherence length. Uh, from a mutual inductance measurement, you can get a rough estimate about uh, uh, penetration depth, right? Okay, and then uh, of course, just to, to show uh, in the paper that uh, we have measured many samples and uh, the su superconductivity is very robust. And, uh, but you can see uh, uh, until uh, here that uh, we, we didn't have a very good control on TC values. It means that uh, one sample, any, uh, like uh, one sample came out, coming out from the series that can have a, quite different TC uh, compared to others. So this is a clearly a, a fundamental material growth control problem. So uh, we went on to uh, actually to perform even further uh, deep materials character, uh, sorry, material uh, optimization. And then we could actually uh, uh, went ahead and study the, let's say things like uh, temperature, uh, transition temperature dependence sorry, uh, doping dependence of transition temperatures, et cetera, okay? So this is a um, um, so-called uh, building up a phase diagram uh, by uh, looking at uh, different doping concentrations. Uh, so based on the materials perfection that I just mentioned, we could actually achieve a, a relatively high quality across the series. So you can see that uh, we measure the lattice constant across different doping levels in these inflator compounds, we see a systematic and monotonic change in the C lattice constant, which uh, is perfectly in line with the notion that the strontium ions has a larger ionic radius than the neodymium. So the system 
let's say the uh, lattice volume uh, expands as you increase the content of strontium, right? Uh, we also measured the, uh, the um, resistivity curves for uh, uh, different samples. Uh, we can see that for some of the doping, they show superconductivity. For some of them, they show very interesting uh, 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 metallic uh, and then insulating behavior, metallic to insulating behavior transition. Okay, and uh, after our paper was published, I think it was um, took almost half a year for other groups to reproduce, but luckily there, there were other groups so we could uh, uh, independently verify our results. So if you wish, you can uh, go to these two re references at the uh, right bottom corner to take a look, particularly for uh, uh, the Ariando group uh, in uh, National University of Singapore. They reported also in PRL that uh, uh, a very similar uh, phase diagram as compared to our, our uh, phase diagram, as you will see here in this slide. All right, so we, we try to compare our uh, TC variation to the, uh, let's say, first the data of a, a, a whole doped uh, cuprate as a function of doping level. Uh, you do see that we have a kind of dome uh, structure uh, similar to the cuprate. However, uh, uh, you do see that the, the range of the doping level is uh, uh, relatively narrow uh, compared to cuprates. Also, what's interesting is that, especially in the, uh, uh, both in the underdoped and overdoped regime, uh, there, there's uh, some differences, right? Uh, apart from uh, the weakly insulating behavior I described, Especially in the overdose regime, we recover this uh, uh, weakly insulating behavior, which is rather distinct as compared to uh, the the case in the cuprates, uh, where you you sort of expect a a a you see a, a Fermi liquid behavior uh, in line with uh, that uh, you you, uh, you you put dopings in an insulating uh, system. And we try to co correlate um, the appearance of superconductivity with um, uh, some sort of a, uh, normal state transport behavior. And what we found is that it might have some uh, indication that it uh, relates very well to the like say, quantum resistant per nickel oxygen plane. Uh, you see that the, the, the border line uh, where these um, uh, dotted dashed line uh, and the, the, the dashed uh, red line crosses uh, marked the, the boundary of the superconducting dome. Okay. We also measure um, Hall effect uh, across the board. And uh, what's interesting is that we found first, there, there, there are a few uh, observations. The first, uh, before doping strontium, the system shows a, uh, a negative Hall coefficient. So, which is quite a different from cuprate, right? And it means that um, it probably can be taken as an indication that we do have these the electron pockets participating already uh, at the uh, zero doping level. And as you increase the doping, uh, the uh, Hall coefficient uh, smoothly go across zero, both as a function of doping as, as well as a function of temperature. So this again uh, points to a, a very likely scenario that uh, we have a multiband uh, system. Of course, similar to uh, in the cuprate case, especially in the heavy doped side of a, a, a ho doped cuprates, where uh, people argue that you might have uh, some sort of a Fermi surface reconstruction, right? A Fermi surface topology, topology change. Of course, there could be uh, 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 there could be similar things happening here as well. But our like um, the two cents um, was that at least this shows that we have uh, contributions of uh, different pockets uh, to the Fermi level, uh, which uh, is uh, in line with the, all these DFT calculations. Okay. All right. So after talking about the phase diagram, let me just take uh, one step back to flash you uh, the uh, latest result and our uh, detailed analysis on some of the transport properties particularly uh, for these um, um, uh, HC2 or critical field measurements, right? As I told you already that from this measurement, we could, we could extract a, a coherence length, which is about three to four nanometers. 
Um, so we actually uh, took one of the, uh, let's say, representative high quality samples, which has a doping level of 0 0.2 to 5. Uh, as you can see this uh, cross-sectional uh, TM image, uh, we have a rather uh, a single crystalline uh, film. However, if you look uh, more carefully, we still see this uh, uh, sort of extended defects marked by the uh, RP type of fault as phase boundaries. So nevertheless, this represents the uh, kind of uh, uh, state-of-the-art state, state uh, uh, a high quality sample within our group. So what we did was we went on to measure um, magnetic field response uh, in both uh, outer plane and in plane, right? Um, so I just wanna mention that uh, we need to be careful in selecting our TC definition because, uh, uh, because that uh, we do at a higher temperature, we do have contribution from superconducting fluctuations and at low temperature, uh, that we do see some uh, like a vortex of physics. So I don't have time to go into the details. We perform some analysis to show these uh, different um, 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 contributions. So in the end, we decided to um, uh, pick up a TC definition within the regime that uh, these two contributions are minimized and uh, go on to, to study uh, the, uh, the HC2 behavior in both directions. So here is a summarized slides of what we found. Uh, it is a very busy plot, but I want you to uh, understand the take home message. So the take home message is that um, for the out of, uh, sorry, the in plane, which is on the right, you see a very familiar square root behavior, right? At the first side, you may argue, oh yeah, I know what it is. This is uh, like uh, 2D superconductors. Right, um, geometry confined a superconductor, which will give you a a a let's say uh, which limits your uh, orbital depairing effect in the out of plane direction. However, if you uh, use the ginsburg landau formula to calculate the uh, let's say the thickness, the superconducting thickness, which usually will give you a pretty good estimate of your thin film. Uh, uh, assuming your film is a, your entire film is superconducting. However, what we got here is a pretty off. So by a factor of at least a four or five. So uh, clearly uh, these uh, geometric like, confined scenario is really not applicable to us. So then we, we went on to, um, to think about this and with the help of uh, uh, Mac Bisley, uh, Stanford, are thinking this probably could be a signature of a uh, actually a paramagnetic effect. Uh, it means that uh, the Pauli limit, uh, the Zeeman energy actually dominate the uh, depairing effect when you apply magnetic field uh, uh, into the system. And this was also corroborated by the fact that actually, if you look at the left part of the phase diagram, the system, when you go down to temperature where when the Pauli Effect, Pauli limited effect, paramagnetic effect uh, goes stronger, the system goes uh, uh, into a Pauli limit, uh, limited behavior as well. Right? So the red uh, uh, solid line is a pure orbital limited scenario where you can see that you de uh, deviate from this line pretty quickly at a re relatively high temperature. Right? So, um, so we also, from these analysis, we can actually have a different conclusions like if this is a polylimited superconductors, we're gonna have a probably a single aid pairing and even parity. So what is missing and uh, puzzling to us, I should say is that the uh, a very strange low temperature state, right? Which uh, uh, does not allow us to uh, fully understand the ground system, uh, ground state of the system. So there are many, many different scenarios uh, due to the time limit, I won't, uh, time limit, I won't uh, talk about them if you, are interested, we can talk about this later. All right, so, okay, I am I think I, I need to hurry up a little bit. Um, so I just wanna briefly mention our experimental work on understanding the electronic structure of the system. As I told you already that uh, the nuclear system seems to be a rather a multi-band system and also probably in a more Mott, uh, a Mott Hubbard regime. So there, have been many, many uh, reports, uh, probably some of you saw 
already uh, that uh, discussing the electronic structure and pairing mechanism of this, uh, these uh, compounds. And the Hall effect, of course, uh, support this uh, picture. So experimentally, what we can do, uh, because of this thin film form, what we can do is to, let's say, take our samples to synchrotron and measure uh, X-ray based, uh, using X-ray based the techniques. Particularly, we are uh, interested in two sets of um, uh, different techniques. One is the X-ray absorption spectroscopy, uh, which allows you to have a, um, let's say, uh, chemically um, selective or element selective uh, probe uh, to the local electronic and orbital structure. And also, we can perform um, um, a re resonance in elastic X-ray scattering, thanks to the uh, the a great advance in the in recent years uh, in, uh, for example, uh, probing uh, materials like a cuprate using that this technique with a very high resolution nowadays in the, in in, in uh, many synchrotron uh, facilities. So we can actually uh, uh, see different excitations uh, uh, in the into the system as we shine light in uh, on the material. Right. Okay. Um, so what we did was uh, first XAS and in combining XAS with the X-ray emission spectroscopy, we can uh, be sensitive to both the occupied state and unoccupied state. Um, so just to be brief that uh, we, we probed uh, oxygen K edge and nickel uh, L edge as well. So from the oxygen K edge particularly, we can reach the conclusion that um, unlike in cuprate and the perovskite nickelate, we do not have a, 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 a large hybridization between a 3D orbital and 2D orbitals. And the system look more like a MOT insulator uh, or rather than a charge transfer uh, system. Okay. And also uh, from RICS, we can see, especially in these small features, where is uh, highlighted by the uh, dashed uh, uh, um, uh, box. Uh, this is a small feature is a uh, uh, representation of the hybridization between nickel 3D orbitals and rare earth 5D orbitals. So it seems that there is some uh, crosstalk between uh, rare earth uh, 5D orbitals and nickel 3, uh, 3D orbitals, which it seems to be reasonable if you look at the band structure uh, uh, calculations of the system, right? So to summarize, uh, we, we probably have a rather peculiar system uh, in which the, uh, the role of the oxygen 2p orbitals got uh, dramatically reduced. At the same time, we have larger interactions between e, the rare earth uh, orbitals and uh, uh, 3D orbitals with nickel, okay? And also we perform the, uh, under the, uh, the TM, uh, scanning TM, uh, what, what, what's uh, uh, good about this technique is that we can actually be selective in areas and to avoid those areas which might have defects or a uh, um, incomplete uh, reduction. And we more or less reach the similar um, uh, conclusion uh, that we see a dramatic uh, change in the auction uh, K edge uh, uh, as compared to uh, the chart transfer uh, compounds like uh, for example, perovskite nickelate, okay? All right, so let me try to summarize this. So I won't uh, read uh, all these details in, uh, in, in the conclusion part, but um, just to pose some open questions for your uh, interest or uh, reference, right? Uh, so we are still asking ourselves, what's the role of uh, epitaxial energy, especially in the thin film uh, environment? and of course, people are interested in whether, you know, in other nuclear systems or similar nuclear system, we can have higher TC. And what's the symmetry of a superconducting order parameters? And can we actually have a better way to measure the band structure directly because of the uh, two extra uh, based techniques that I briefly talk about uh, was kind of indirect evidence. And one fundamental question is that, do we actually have magnetic orderings in the system or whether magnetic fluctuations play 
uh, an important role in, in uh, establishing superconductivity. One particular question that you might ask uh, already is uh, whether you have the superconductivity uh, observed in the bulk. Unfortunately, in the, uh, um, I would say the two uh, reported, uh, sorry, reported work uh, on the ceramic uh, wall and two phase, no superconductivity was observed. Of course, you can always ask the question whether this is a due to an extrinsic effect or an intrinsic effect, right? Okay, um, because um, um, the materials growth and synthesis already is a very uh, tough uh, uh, job for us. And uh, any nickel impurities uh, which could uh, be present in the system will probably kill your uh, magnetization measurement signal, right? But what if it is, it is intrinsic, it would be interesting because um, whether it means that uh, in the thin film geometry, you have uh, uh, maybe uh, different um, um, uh, things happening, for example, magnetic ordering of fluctuations uh, established, or people are wondering about like interface effect, uh, uh, um, which is related to STL substrate. So I didn't have time, I don't have time to uh, uh, talk about this anymore. I just want to flash out that actually as a one uh, important step uh, moving forward, we could actually uh, observe superconductivity in, a, in another uh, uh, material, which is a prosthenium uh, uh, nickelate, 112. And we could also uh, uh, establish a phase diagram, like a preliminary phase diagram uh, uh, of this system, okay? Um, I think I already covered this. Um, uh, there are many fundamental questions we can ask ourselves uh, for this new uh, superconductor. Uh, for example, what's the uh, appropriate ground state theoretical starting point for nickel superconductors as compared to cuprates and nictites, right? Um, and also, uh, uh, what would be the, the, the phases adjacent to superconductivities? whether you can have like a quantum critical uh, 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 behavior or uh, phenomena in, in the phase diagram, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I, I would like to advertise a little bit about these uh, uh, topotactic transition technique. Um, so we're using PLD uh, here, uh, as uh, some of you may know that Paul's laser deposition, actually because of the uh, uh, a, a very strong laser pulse uh, generated, uh, let's say plume or plasma state, you can actually uh, access uh, a rather unique material growth uh, territory where you can have a more kinetic control, right? And this topotactic transition is also can be viewed as a more, uh, let's say kinetic control because you're taking advantage of the different uh, mobilities of uh, ions in your system without, you know, without modifying the, the, the lattice structure as a, at relatively low temperature. So compare, uh, combining these uh, techniques, so uh, whether we can have a, a great opportunities to fabricate uh, new materials and study the physics in these uh, novel systems, I think it's a very uh, interesting directions, uh, direction that we, 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 we might uh, think about we might want to think about. Okay, so this is my final slide. Um, I would like to just acknowledge all my wonderful collaborators across uh, a different university and different uh, uh, light sources. And also uh, uh, my uh, colleague at Stanford who helped us understand the electronic structure and uh, interpret our experimental data. So here are the references I, I briefly covered and Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry about the time. <laughs> Chad, thanks, Tim. That was great. Yeah, a lot of really interesting results uh, there. Um, so yeah, so we've still got time for some questions. If uh, anyone wants to either enter it in the chat or you can just unmute yourself if you have a question. So actually I had several questions, just most of which you sort of raised in the your outlook and sort of future work. And mm -hmm. I guess one of the items was um, you know, around the uh, symmetry of the of the pairing. Yeah. 
Right. Um, do you have any yeah, insights on that at all? Or, um... Yeah, I, I should say this. So here I listed, if you look at the blue um, text, I should say that uh, a group led by uh, Professor Wen Haihu uh, at Nanjing University in China, uh, and near film, a professor near your phone. Um, so they actually perform, they first they reproduced our uh, results by using MBE. Uh, so they could grow the thin film by MBE and saw superconductivity. And then they went on uh, using their uh, state of the art STM uh, MB facility. Uh, what they observe on the surface of the sample that they saw, um, let's say spectros uh, spectroscopic signature, uh, which seems to um, correspond to two gap, like uh, uh, gaps with a different uh, um, symmetry, right? right? They argue in the paper that you can have S wave and D wave, et cetera. But I, I, I should, you know, caution here that and normally because of the material growth challenge, we don't really have, you see actually in their paper as well that we don't have very smooth surface, right? And we have a little like a, a, bun a bunching at the surface. So, you know, whether what you probe here is indeed uh, intrinsic superconducting properties uh, pertaining to the system, or it's a little perturbed by, you know, you know, material imperfections, et cetera, et cetera. It's unclear to me. So uh, with that, I'd like to maybe try to answer your question here that a lot of theoretical discussion have already uh, discussed about the, uh, the role of the D orbitals, of course, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, it's still one of the, uh, let's say the most relevant orbital, if you wish, submitted to cuprate. Uh, however, you know, because of the uh, different, the role of different orbitals and unclear, people are discussing about uh, when you change your doping levels as you move across the phase diagram, whether you indeed can have uh, some uh, different scenarios or different symmetry in your superconducting order parameters. So, so I think it's an open question. I, I do not have a very good answer. I think one key experiment, at least from a transport guy, is that we can actually do this very uh, beautiful uh, uh, bicrystal, tricrystal measurement in order to fully establish the, uh, let's say, whether it's a D uh, wave or, you know, S wave, et cetera. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, Nikhil, did you want to ask your question? Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, I just, I was just wondering, is the epitaxial strain in some of these material systems significantly is expected to modify the orbital hybridization? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. I think so, um, but uh, due to limited uh, um, data available, right? Uh, right now, we unfortunately only have a data on an STO because, um, not because we're not interested in growing the material on different substrate, right? Uh, uh, it's because the, the, the um, stabilization of the material on different substrate uh, involve a different growth a thermodynamic process. And we found it's very difficult, has been very difficult for us to, to actually grow the, even the perovskite phase on another substrate. So we're still working on this. And if you, in terms of the epitaxial strain, if you look at the STO, take uh, neodymium nucleate 112 as an example, it poses a um, relatively small compressive strain right. to the film. And of course, the, the, uh, if you look, simply look at the uh, crystal splitting uh, or you know, uh, the strain effect on, on a system, you would argue that you should change your hybridization uh, um, um, with the presence of the strain, right? Uh, I think there are few uh, a theoretical report discussing this, but I not, uh, I don't have it on top of my head. I'm not very familiar with your yeah, conclusion. But I, I do assume that it should uh, uh, affect the hybridization. And what is the maximum uh, degree of epitaxial strain these materials can handle? All right, so in the, in, in, in the perovskite phase, actually, it, a, it has a rather uh, large uh, epitaxial uh, strain or lattice mismatch. It's almost like a 3%, right? 
-hmm. right? If you grow perovskite on STO, I think the perovskite uh, is uh, the bulk values are roughly about 3.8 uh, Amstron and STO is a 3.91 Amstron. So there is a, indeed already a large epitaxial strain. I think um, there are certain experts in the audience um, uh, which know better than me. In, in, in principle, in these epitaxial uh, thin film growth, in particularly in the perovskite oxide phase, we can probably achieve something like uh, as large as 4% most. Um, but, um, and then you already face some, you know, um, struck uh, materials issues already. I think of that's a sort of a hard deadline, uh, sorry, hard um, uh, uh, ceiling or limit. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Michael, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, thank, thanks for the nice talk, Denver. Um, Michael, good uh, to see you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's oh, uh, good to see you. Yeah, good to yeah. hear from you. Um, uh, so I'm wondering if there's any evidence for this idea that maybe the the fact that these these films are thin or that there there's an interface effect is uh, is going on. Um, is there a thickness dependence to the TC or does it depend on what kind of capping layer uh, you put on top? Right, right. Yeah, that's a good great question. Um, unfortunately, we did not um, have a very complete story uh, on the thickness dependence, which is very important, obviously, um, because simply because uh, we don't have uh, much to play here, right? Our entire film yeah. is uh, 10 nanometer, right? And uh, so maybe um, I'm not sure if I uh, say this correctly. So if you uh, try to grow thicker films, you, you immediately go to a regime where you, uh, you, you it's very easy to uh, to uh, to see a secondary phase coming in. Mm. So, um, and so that brings us to the question of what's the role of the epitaxial energy, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, and then when you go down, actually, we have a few data points, uh, but we don't have a very solid uh, conclusion on on that. Um, so definitely, it will be interesting to see the thickness dependence in order to answer the question about the interface superconductivity. However, I can maybe already say this is that um, preliminary data on different substrate like LSAT uh, seems to point out that this is the superconductivity behavior is not unique to STO. So if you're worried about like uh, interface superconductivity relate, related to STO. Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so one final question. Dong Chen, do you want to ask your question? Uh, <clears throat> very nice talk, Denpen. Uh, just, uh, I think it's a bit related to the Michael uh, question by Michael. So uh, uh, could you explain a bit more on the two channel conduction, especially why you have a electron Thanks. conduction channels, whether right. that could happen at the interface, like you have a two deck at the interface, or that's intrinsic uh, electron pocket to the nucleate? Yeah, that's a very good question, yeah. Thank you for asking this. So let me give you a, a, a first answer to uh, why we believe there are two channel or uh, you know two types of carriers, which uh, stems from these uh, Fermi surface, right? You have electron pockets and then uh, this more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, whole band, um, uh, which has a slightly uh, uh, KZ dependence. Um, so if you believe that uh, these electron pockets and whole bands contribute to, to transport, you may expect that you can measure uh, uh, charge carriers of different signs, um, um, depending on their, you know, where your Fermi level is, right? However, you, do ask, you did ask a very good question about the interface um, contribution. Of course, in the uh, STO, um, let's say in the film grown on STO case, we simply cannot rule out this possibility, right? STO has been known to host a two DAG uh, at the interface. And those two DAGs are normally like electron uh, 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 carriers, right? So, so we stated in, the, in, 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 the, in our first paper about this. I think the best way to, to, to actually let's say to isolate these effects is by growing films on different substrate, which is an ongoing uh, uh, activity. Yeah. 
I think it's a good question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, thanks, Denver, and thanks, everyone. I think we might leave it there. Um, I'm right. sure if anyone's got any further questions, I'm sure Denver will be happy to discuss. Sure, um, yeah. But thank yeah, you. thanks again for Yeah, yeah, a, yeah feel free to talk. shoot me an email if you have a question. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thanks. thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.